Welcome to Downtown Detroit. This is the second of two videos about downtown, focusing on Grand Circus Park and its environs. As usual, this video is designed as an aid to exploration. Log off the computer, pull up this video on your phone, and go for a walk. Each time I'm done talking about a building, I'll throw up a map to get you to the next one. Pause the video and take a stroll. Indeed, feel free to wander off script for a while. I'll still be there when you get to the next site, and there's always another side street to explore. Detroit is one of the oldest settlements on the Great Lakes, dating to 1701, but for nearly the entire colonial period, the settlement clung to the riverfront, south of today's walk. A defining event for the area came in 1805, when a fire almost entirely destroyed the fledgling community. Taking advantage of the temporarily empty cityscape, Judge Augustus Woodward proposed the new city ought to be rebuilt on monumental lines, developing an innovative street plan centered on a series of large circular parks connected by radiating streets and a series of smaller triangular parks. Inspired by L'Enfant's plan for the city of Washington, Woodward's design nevertheless features unique elements entirely its own. Woodward's plan wasn't carried out in its entirety. South of Michigan Avenue, the colonial grid was re-established, and when development came to extend north of Grand Circus Park in the mid-19th century, the city's grid pattern reasserted itself. Nevertheless, Woodward's design survives in what became the northern half of downtown Detroit, creating a street plan which is frequently confusing to strangers attempting to navigate it for the first time, but which also creates an endless series of interesting urban vistas interspersed with such fine urban spaces as Capitol Park. The area around Grand Circus Park developed in the 19th century as an upscale residential area with large and ornate residences and churches fronting onto Woodward's Park and avenues. Indeed, commercial interests didn't begin to significantly penetrate the area until the 1880s, and even then only tentatively. In the early 20th century, however, a number of fine hotels were erected on Grand Circus Park, taking advantage of the park's residential cachet. They were quickly followed by theaters and department stores, with the effect that by the 1920s, the northern half of downtown had been transformed into the retail and entertainment center of Michigan, while the financial center remained in the old city. Today's walk begins on Capitol Park, at the intersection of Griswold and Shelby Streets. Capitol Park is a triangle of land left over in Woodward's Detroit plan, and one of the city's finest outdoor spaces. The park takes its name from the fact that Michigan's first state legislature was located here before the capital was moved to Lansing. The buildings surrounding the park today are all substantially later, mostly dating from the last decade of the 19th century and the first quarter of the 20th. Of particular note is the eight-story Farwell building at 1259 Griswold on the west side of the park. Designed by the firm Bona and Chaffee in 1915, the building's lobby features Tiffany Glass. Leave Capitol Park walking west on State Street to Washington Boulevard, then turn left, walking a block south on Washington to Michigan Avenue. The building on the northeast corner of Michigan and Washington is the Book Cadillac Hotel, one of Detroit's finest hotels. There has been a hotel on the site since 1852. The site rose to prominence, however, with the erection of the Cadillac Hotel in 1888, designed by John Scott. The hotel was the most opulent in Detroit when erected, and became the center of much of Detroit's social life, playing home to no less than five American presidents. The hotel, however, eventually declined, surpassed by newer, larger facilities elsewhere in the city. In 1917, the hotel was purchased by the Book Brothers, prominent Detroit real estate investors. They hired Lewis Camper to design a new hotel for the site, and in 1925, the new Book Cadillac Hotel opened to the public. The new hotel was the city's largest, and at 33 stories, the tallest hotel in the world when it was built. Over the course of its life, it housed individuals ranging from the Beatles to Martin Luther King to John F. Kennedy. The hotel was badly affected by the drop in tourism associated with Detroit's mid-20th century decline, and in 1984 the hotel closed, apparently for good. After several years of abandonment, however, the hotel was renovated and reopened in 2008. Return north along Washington Boulevard for a block and a half. You're looking for the Roman Catholic Church on the east side of Washington at 1232 Washington Boulevard. At one point, St. Aloncius was only one of several Roman Catholic churches in what is today downtown Detroit. The original home of the parish was erected in 1861 as a Presbyterian church, but purchased by the city's Catholic community in 1873, at which point it received its present name 
and briefly served as Detroit's cathedral. The church became best known, however, for its popular noontime services, attended by office workers downtown on their lunch break. By 1930, the old church had become insufficient to hold the noontime parishioners, and a new structure was erected by Donaldson and Muir. Limited by the small site, the new church was forced to adopt an innovative interior plan, with pews distributed over three levels. The eight-story office building north of St. Alonsius was also designed by Donaldson and Muir for the Catholic Church in 1924, and today serves as offices for the Archdiocese of Detroit. Continue half a block north on Washington Boulevard to the intersection with Grand River. Washington Boulevard's history will be forever associated with the Book Brothers, J. Burgess Book, and his brothers Herbert and Frank. When the men were born in the late 19th century, the boulevard was an upscale residential area, flanked by large houses. By the turn of the century, however, Washington had become run down, and its future appeared to be as a relatively marginal appendage to Detroit's core. The Book Brothers, however, envisioned an elegant upscale shopping avenue, and in the 1910s they began systematically purchasing property on the street. Eventually they would own over half the properties on Washington between Michigan and Grand Circus Park, and together with their architect Lewis Camper would entirely rebuild the street. The Book Cadillac Hotel was one of the Book Brothers' investments. Another two sit across from one another at Washington and Grand River. The structure on the southwest corner of Washington and Grand River is the Book Building, the brothers' first investment on Washington Boulevard and Lewis Camper's first large commercial commission. The earliest section of the building was the 13-story southern portion, erected in 1917. The brothers, however, were unsatisfied, seeking to break into Detroit's booming office market. Accordingly, they commissioned an adjoining tower on the corner with Grand River, completed in 1926. Lewis Camper's tower has been endlessly derided by architectural critics as top-heavy and grotesque. It is true that the building's ornamentation hangs together poorly, leading the structure to seem inelegant. But on a personal level, this has always been one of my favorite Detroit buildings. The tower is a riot of ornamentation, and what it lacks in composure, it more than makes up for in enthusiasm. When built, the structure was the tallest building in Detroit, a title it lost to the Penobscot building a mere two years later. The Book Brothers planned to recapture the title, and so in 1928, they asked Lewis Camper to design a second tower to be erected on the south end of the Book Building, fronting onto State Street. The new structure would have been 81 stories tall, the tallest structure not just in Detroit, but in the entire world at the time. The stock market crash of 1929, however, permanently ended plans for the new building. Across from the Book Building, on the northeast corner of Washington and Grand River, is another structure erected for the Book Brothers by Lewis Camper. This one, the Industrial Bank Building, erected in 1928. A far more classically elegant structure than the Book Building across the street, the building rises to a crown that marries Gothic and Art Deco elements. Turn left and walk three blocks west on Grand River Avenue to Cass Avenue. The castle-like building on the northwest corner of Grand River and Cass is the Grand Army of the Republic Building erected in 1899 by the firm of Hess and Ressman. The Grand Army of the Republic was founded shortly after the American Civil War as a social organization for Union veterans. The organization became popular among veterans, and by the 1890s it claimed nearly half a million members. The Grand Army of the Republic developed into an important social institution, dominating political and social life across large portions of the northern United States for a period. At the turn of the century, the city of Detroit went so far as to erect this large structure for the organization's use, leasing it to them free of charge until 1930. The organization's membership, however, was tied firmly to the Civil War, and as such its membership declined sharply in the early years of the 20th century, as the country's Civil War veterans began to die of old age. When the Grand Army of the Republic's lease of the structure came up in 1930, there were only a few hundred veterans left alive in the Detroit area. The city allowed the surviving veterans to continue to use rooms in the building until the last Detroit veteran died in 1942. The building struggled to find a new use, and by the 1980s, the structure was shuttered. The building was extensively renovated in 2013. Return a block west along Grand River to Bagley Avenue. Turn left and stop in front of the large building on the west side of Bagley. The Michigan Theater was erected in 1926 as a combined movie theater and office building designed by the firm of Rapp and Rapp. 
At the time, the theater was one of the largest and most opulent in the city. The theater, however, is of greatest interest not for its life, but for its death. In the 1970s, the adjoining office building was in need of additional parking, and the prospect of erecting a parking garage on the site of the theater was raised. The theater proved structurally necessary for the building, however, and as such it was gutted for parking. At the time, the owners made the interesting decision to retain the theater's ceilings, and as such, stepping into the parking garage of the Michigan building is one of life's truly surreal experiences, a parking garage like no other in the world. Ironically, the Michigan theater stands on the site where Henry Ford once built his first car. Continue walking up Bagley Avenue, a block and a half, to Grand Circus Park. Grand Circus Park is a semicircle of green space at the center of Augustus Woodward's plan for Detroit. Originally planned as a full circle, Woodward's plan never got laid out north of Adams Avenue. Grand Circus Park is the centerpiece of downtown Detroit's northern half. Nearly every street in the area either points to the park or circles around it. As late as the turn of the century, the park was dominated by a series of large Victorian mansions, but in the early years of the 20th century, the park was transformed first by the addition of several large hotels, and later by the development of the city's theatre district. The head of Bagley Avenue at Grand Circus Park was once home to two of Detroit's greatest hotels. To the west stood the Hotel Tuller, erected in 1906, the first hotel on the park. The Tuller was expanded several times before being demolished in 1991. To the east stood the Statler Hotel, erected in 1914. Designed by New York architect George Post, the building was the third hotel on Statler's growing empire. Ellsworth Statler had opened his first hotel in Buffalo in 1901 and rapidly gained a reputation for quality. Not aiming at luxury, the Statler hotels nevertheless generally achieved it. The Detroit Hotel, for instance, was the first hotel constructed in the city with a private bathroom attached to every room, an innovation at the time. The Statler was hit hard by the decline of tourism in Detroit in the mid-20th century and after a period of closure and a preservation fight, the building was demolished in 2005. Cross the street into Grand Circus Park and make your way through the park to the intersection of Woodward and Adams. As you go, notice the string of excellent early 20th century facades along the northern side of the park, including the Fine Arts Building at 44 West Adams, built in 1905 by Lewis Camper, and the Gothic RH5 Shoe Building on the northwest corner of Woodward and Adams, designed in 1919 by the firm of Smith, Henchman, and Grillis. On the northeast corner of Woodward and Adams is the Central United Methodist Church, the last survivor of the park's residential past. Erected in 1867 by Gordon Lloyd, the Gothic building served one of Detroit's most prominent Methodist communities. The structure's unusual proportions date from the 1936 widening of Woodward Avenue. Facing growing traffic, the city of Detroit decided in 1936 to expand Woodward to the east, removing several feet from each of the properties on that side of the street. Many property owners simply removed the existing facades of their buildings at the time, creating new ones at the new street line. Central United Methodist, however, elected to remove a portion of the building's nave, thereby preserving the remarkable Woodward Avenue facade, but relocating it to almost touch the church's transepts. Just inside Grand Circus Park, on the southeast corner of Woodward and Adams, is a seated statue of Hazen Pinigree, mayor of Detroit from 1890 to 1897, and widely regarded as one of the best mayors the city has ever had. Coming to office at a time of widespread corruption at City Hall, Pinigree successfully campaigned against both bribery and monopolistic practices, having several bureaucrats arrested and taking on even the railway companies, the largest and most powerful corporations of the day. During a severe recession in the 1890s, he had vegetables grown on vacant lots in the city to provide food for Detroit's poor. Upon his death, an outpouring of public support for a monument resulted in this statue, paid for by over 5,000 small contributions from the city's population. Walk two blocks north on Woodward, to the intersection of Woodward and Columbia. On the east side of Woodward, taking up the entire block from Columbia to Montcalm, is the Fox Theatre. One of Detroit's most ornate theatres, the structure was erected in 1928, designed by Howard Crane, one of the leading theatre architects of his day. Like many of its contemporaries, the theatre was incorporated into the ground floor of an office complex, maximizing the developer's use of a valuable downtown plot of land. 
The oriental style of the theater and lobby are typical of the flamboyance deemed appropriate for the design of large theaters in the 1920s. If you're interested, continue north on Woodward to see the Gothic St. John's Episcopal Church at 2326 Woodward, erected in 1861 by Jordan and Anderson. Otherwise, or when you're finished, return south, passing through Grand Circus Park to the intersection of Grand Circus and Madison. The structure on the south side of Madison, east of Grand Circus Park, is the Detroit Opera House. Built as the Capitol Theatre in 1922 to plans by Howard Crane, an expert in theatre design, the structure extends through the block, with facades on both Madison and Broadway. Interestingly, the two facades are quite different, with Broadway featuring a classical design ornamented with white terracotta, and Madison featuring a much more subdued red brick facade. The theatre was originally erected as a movie theatre, run by John Kunsky. Kunsky had been responsible for the first public showing of a movie in Detroit, and by the 1920s, as technology improved, Kunsky came to dominate the theatre industry in the city, operating nearly a dozen theatres within steps of Grand Circus Park, including the Michigan Theatre, seen earlier in the walk. In the mid-20th century, the capital suffered from declining attendance, and the last film played in the building in 1978. After several years of abandonment, the structure was identified as a potential new home of the Michigan Opera, and after three years of renovations and the construction of an extensive backstage area fronting onto Grand Circus Park, the structure reopened as the Detroit Opera House in 1996. Continue walking east along Madison Street. At the northeast corner of Madison and John Arm, you'll see the Detroit Athletic Club, a splendid Renaissance structure designed by Albert Kahn in 1915. Turn right onto Randolph Street and walk south into Harmony Park. Harmony Park is another of the delightful small triangles of open space left over from Woodward's plan for Detroit. The park is most notable, however, for the Harmony Club on the park's west side, on the northwest corner of Center and Grand River. Erected in 1895 to designs by Richard Rassman, the building originally housed the German-American Club, indicative of the flood of Central European immigration which poured into Detroit in the mid-19th century. The Harmony Club offered a social setting for German immigrants, supporting German art and music in the city. Continue south on Randolph Street, to the intersection of Randolph and Gratiot. Turn right and walk two blocks southwest on Gratiot to the downtown branch of the Detroit Public Library. Detroit's library system dates to 1865, opening in makeshift quarters in the old state capitol building on Capitol Park. Within a decade, however, the building was deemed impractical, and a larger space was required for the city's library. Accordingly, the city donated Center Park, yet another of the triangles created by Woodward's plan, to the library for the construction of a new building. The structure was a Victorian masterpiece designed by Brash and Smith and opened in 1877. Inside, it featured an enormous reading room flanked by stacks of books accessed by the librarians. The building, however, was less impressive than it appeared to be. Cost-cutting during the construction had left it both too small and impermanently built. As the city boomed, the need for further branches across the city was badly felt. The first neighborhood library branches opened in 1900, but the central library still proved insufficient, and as such, a new central library was erected north of downtown in 1921. The Victorian building lingered on for a few years before being replaced with a new Art Deco library branch in 1932, the present downtown library. Walk north on Library Street to Farmer, then continue north on Farmer another block to John R. The tall building terminating the view up Farmer Street is the Metropolitan Building. Erected in 1925 to plans by Weston and Ellington, the Gothic Tower was built in an effort to bring the city's entire jewelry industry under a single roof. The lower floors of the building originally held retail spaces where jewelry and related items were sold, while the upper floors were occupied by hundreds of artisans. Turn left, walking a block west to Woodward Avenue. Woodward is Detroit's principal shopping thoroughfare, home at one point to several department stores, and still home to a wide variety of shops. The street is architecturally diverse, with nearly every building representing a treat of some sort. Notice in particular the Wright K building on the northeast corner of Woodward and John R., erected in 1891 to plans by Gordon Lloyd. Turn left and walk south on Woodward two blocks to the intersection of Woodward and State, 
An unfortunate end to today's walk, the northeast corner of Woodward and State was home for nearly three quarters of a century to Hudson's, the icon and anchor of retailing in downtown Detroit. The building itself was a patchwork, erected in phases as Hudson's grew from a small clothing store to the world's second largest department store, filling the entire block. The earliest parts of the building dated to 1911. The department store closed in 1983, but the structure continued to be used for offices for several years thereafter. The building was demolished in 1998, leaving a hole in downtown Detroit which has yet to be filled. Walk a block west on State Street, returning to Capitol Park. If you're interested, our walk through Detroit's financial district also begins and ends at this point. There's a link in the description.